I hand you this assurance that I shall take no notice whatever of any further correspondence which you may address to me. So declared Francis Pettit Smith in late February 1864. Smith, we see here, an engineer of screw-propelled steamships, a curator at London's Patent Museum, was then attempting to extract himself from an acrimonious dispute, a dispute over artifacts he had unearthed in the Birmingham factory of 18th century industrialist Matthew Bolton, a dispute over evidence appearing to move the invention of photography in both space and time. For in the fall of 1862, Smith had traveled to Birmingham, seeking to acquire an early prototype of James Watt's improvements to the steam engine. Amidst the crumbling walls of Bolton's Soho manufactory, Smith met with an agent of the Bolton family named Edward Price. From the library at Soho emerged a folio in which, as Price would tell it, Smith, quote, discovered these sun pictures and begged them of me. Sun pictures, that was the phrase used in the 1860s to describe the array of artifacts that we see here. Parsed now by the logics of London Science Museum, which owns them, these five objects count as mechanical paintings. They figure as products of a Soho-based enterprise by Bolton, Watt, Francis Edgington, and others to replicate paintings by Sir Joshua Reynolds, American artist, you're welcome, Benjamin West, um, and other leading academic painters of the later 18th century. Smith's set also included images now identified as stipple engravings by academician Angelica Kaufman, as well as a silver plate now lost, and I reproduce it with this print, hand-tinted, pulled from or after said lost plate in the upper right hand corner of my array, apparently representing Soho House before its architectural renovations in 1791. Heterogeneous though they may now appear, all were understood in the 1860s to derive from 1780s efforts by Bolton and Watt to replicate oil paintings by chemomechanical means. But why had Bolton, Watt, and the Soho operation been in the business of replicating oil paintings at all? The story I share with you this afternoon comes from a forthcoming book called Painting with Fire that expands upon advice dispensed by Reynolds at Britain's Royal Academy of Arts. Quote, pick up from dunghills what by a nice chemistry passing through your own mind shall be converted into pure gold, unquote. So Reynolds had instructed aspiring artists in 1774. First Royal Academy president, leading society painter, Reynolds was also an inveterate chemical experimentalist. Informed by technical trials, he had joined at the, in the 1750s at London Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacturers, and Commerce. Reynolds became notorious for introducing unusual, unstable media into his paintings. Beeswax, spermaceti extract, bitumen, resins. With these and other substances, Reynolds mixed pigments to paint this so-called self-portrait as a deaf man of 1775, now at the Tate. If, experiments, uh, if such experiments could deliver audacious triumphs that appeared to contemporaries as appreciating in value, not losing it as they changed visibly in time, other trials would flake, buckle, and fade. They ruptured pictorial integrity, as in this portrait of banker James Coutts, a painting donated to the fledgling National Gallery of Scotland in the 1850s, as a means of teaching a moral lesson to aspiring artists about the dangers of Reynolds's risky techniques. Now, it's not enough to say that Reynolds's contemporaries knew about these chemical experiments. Painters like Benjamin West, who followed Reynolds as the Royal Academy's second president, you see here on the left, inherited a technical landscape, remade in Reynolds's influential image, target of the delicious scandal of the Venetian secret in the late 1790s. West embraced Alwa Senefelder's new imprimerie chimique, or lithography, invented 1796-1798. He collaborated with entrepreneurs selling, in chemical terms, a material stability Reynolds had eschewed from art in the grand manner. Through, quote, 
a delicacy of chemical practice, as one such practitioner called it. These chemical replications could provide, quote, a unique art of heightening and preserving the beauty of tints to futurity without a possibility of their changing, unquote. So the story that I want to tell you this afternoon is about what happened when those chemical replicas, those whose largest surviving specimen at center right, will I be able to do this? Oh, center left, sorry. Uh, help me, Rhonda. Oh, wrong way. Oh, well, that one. <laughs> um, uh, the largest surviving specimen at center left reproduces a design exhibited by Benjamin West in 1775, were rediscovered in the 1860s, used by Francis uh, Pettit Smith to shift credit for the invention of photography away from Louis Daguerre or William Henry Fox Talbot around the Annus Mirabilis of 1839 back to Enlightenment Birmingham, these images would also do more. They would get Soho agent Edward Price fired, ruined financially, literally run out of England. They would lock curator Smith into a pitch battle with an unlikely foe. Unlikely, because there was no greater enemy to these sun pictures than Matthew Pierce Watt Bolton, the Soho industrialist's own grandson. But how did these 1780s sun pictures really relate to sun pictures in the 1860s? To what inheritors of Nisiphor Niepce, Niepce's heliographs or Sir David Brewster's talk of drawing by the agency of light had come to call photographs? Were Smith's sun pictures actually photographic? That is what the 1860s debate appears to be about. I take a different view. Pressing on the more elemental problems of why Matthew Pierce Watt Bolton was so keen to discredit Edward Price and to thwart Francis Pettit Smith's endeavor to award photography's invention to his grandfather, I suggest how the sun pictures can reveal some inconvenient truths about what we have come to call photography, even as they enable us to dissolve the hold of photography as interpretive category. Instead, I'll propose that a linked relay of academic oil paintings and their replicas, calotypes, steam engines, and combustion-driven airplanes disclosed amidst this sun pictures narrative are better apprehended as moments in the history of what I call temporally evolving chemical objects, of chemical materials known and valued for changing conspicuously in time while affording conceptual reflection on time. And just as photography is a subset episode, not culminating telos of that history. So Smith's quest for engines at Soho helps us rethink Talbot's own engines, along with the broader implication of fine art painting and so-called photo history in combustion engine research. We know little of Soho agent Edward Price, who claimed to have worked at the Bolton factory since the 1830s. Over the winter of 1862-3, he proved supremely skillful in sourcing startling artifacts from the dilapidated factory. A chance encounter with a Birmingham auctioneer reminds him that, quote, some years ago, I turned out all the rubbish and waste paper in the Soho library, and he bought the old scrap paper. And amongst it was a very curious picture, which he says is neither chalk, crayon, Indian ink, print, or painting as Price tracks the camera that supposedly made these strange images, other volunteers contact Curator Smith, eager to share instruments vaguely remembered, practices putatively employed at Soho half a century earlier. These acts of memorialization speak surely to a period perception that the steam engine driven industrial present was separated from the 18th century by a gap only widening in its immensity. These uh, and Birmingham had felt those seismic changes acutely. The city had become a site of intensive union organizing after the economic slump of the 1820s, Chartist riots in 1839, even as its city center was remade around Watt's steam engine technology and the Soho factory itself destroyed in 1863. For price, Writing on the wrong side of Birmingham's Bull Ring riots, with the benevolent industrial paternalism he associated with the first Matthew Bolton, replaced by Victorian Booster's bureaucratized schemes, that forgetfulness was no accident. 
For the SOHO that Price imagines is something worthy of Lunar Society associate Joseph Wright of Darby. As in Wright's 1771, and this is a title, this is not just my weird riff, The Alchemist. Here's our title. The Alchemist, in search of the Philosopher's Stone, discovers phosphorus and prays for the successful conclusion of his operation, as was the custom of the ancient chemical astrologers. Breathe in. Uh, Price's Bolton and Watt commanded technologies of unearthly power. Price claims that the sun pictures prized by Smith had been made during the Lunar Society meetings, quote, in a dark tent, and there was nothing to be seen except a picture on the table. By some process, they secured this shadow, unquote. Moreover, the library where the sun pictures were made was itself a Masonic temple. Quote, when we pulled down the old library upon the plaster, I found traces of the emblems of masonry. There was East Delta over C and other signs, but of course, you not being a mason, I cannot explain anymore. And powerful artists had long stood opposed to the sun pictures. After Sir William Beechey, who we see here on the left, painted Bolton's portrait on the right in the 1790s, so Smith says, Beechey, quote, went among all the artists and got up a petition to Matthew Bolton and the Lunar Society, begging them to stop the sun pictures because the secret would, if made known, be the means of shutting up the painter's shops. Delusional, as Price sounds here, his fears would prove entirely justified once Smith presented his research to the Photographic Society of London in late 1863. There, Smith's claims for the sun pictures as revolutionary photographs convinced many. Photographer George Shadbolt, whose 1857 albumen silver print we see here, was persuaded by the now lost silver plate depicting Soho Library. Examining it carefully with the lens, quote, he was assured that it was a camera image from nature, which took back the invention of photography to a period before 1791. If others were more skeptical, a nationalistic British press loved the story. Against French priority, one paper crowed, Birmingham may claim the honor of being the place in which the art of photography was discovered and first practiced, unquote. And less than a week after his public presentation, Smith's findings were read by Matthew Pierce Watt Bolton. Born in 1820, raised on an 8,000 acre estate in Oxfordshire, educated at Eton and Cambridge, Matthew Pierce Watt Bolton would seem to cut the figure of the Victorian country gentleman. Initially, Bolton assented to Smith's claims. If his intelligent and useful servant, Price, had likely missed some of the details, Bolton then argued, quote, the pictures made at Soho by the secret method practiced there were produced in some way by the agency of light. But Bolton quickly changed his tune. In his 1864 remarks concerning certain photographs supposed to be of early date, Bolton accuses Price of stealing money from the Soho operation while dousing cold water all over Smith's story. Methods of replicating academic paintings developed by his grandfather were, he now asserts, mechanical. But those techniques were, quote, probably widely different from photography. Their products never described as sun pictures. Further, after delegating agents to interrogate octogenarians surviving in Greater Birmingham, Bolton charges that the building depicted in the lost silver plate was neither Soho Library nor was the plate old. So rather, then being made in the 1780s by his grandfather through some mysterious technique in the very library in which they would be found, the silver plate was now credited to his aunt working in the 1840s with a bog standard daguerreotype process and depicting a different building entirely. Splitting metal and paper apart, dismissing the former as photographic but not ancient, the latter as from the 18th century but not photographic, sun pictures qua photographs had effectively ceased to exist. But what if we were to release the sun pictures from photography's grasp? Remember here that Francis Pettit Smith had gone to Soho in 1862 to find a prototype of Watt's steam engine, an instrument that University of Sydney historian of science, David Philip Miller, encourages us to see not as an anticipation of thermodynamics, but as a contribution to the history of chemistry. Smith 
had no small interest in Watt. Best known for his practical advances in screw-propelled steamships, Smith was not only likened to Watt in the period, but his engineering achievements would be praised by Bolton himself in the very Sun Pictures pamphlets otherwise assailing Smith's judgment. And just as he was scuppering the Sun Pictures in the 1860s, Bolton was making patent applications of his own, patents on airplane ailerons that continue to figure in histories of aeronautics. In a remarkable text called On Aerial Locomotion, also from 1864, Bolton describes the novelty of his airplane like this, quote, earlier projectors in the art of flight principally aimed at imitating the wings of birds, but since the use of the screw propeller for the propulsion of steamships, the employment of a similar propeller for aerial locomotion naturally suggests itself. Propelled then by the screw mechanism he knew to be the product of Francis Pettit Smith's hard graft, Bolton's aircraft faced a crucial challenge. How could an engine generate sufficient power to lift the plane off the ground? Acknowledging the example of Watt's steam engine, Bolton pleads for chemical research on new explosive compounds. Yet already in 1864, so the year of his second Sun Pictures pamphlet, Bolton had located a highly promising explosive, gun cotton. Quote, a suitable quantity of gun cotton being introduced into a chamber near the cylinder and there ignited, the gas thus generated would rush into the cylinder and work the piston, just as is now done by steam, to communicate a rapid rotation to an aerial propeller. Some six times more explosive than gunpowder, gun cotton or nitrocellulose was a compound first synthesized in the 1830s. It remained extremely dangerous. An explosion of a manufactory in East Anglia was but one example uh, that killed uh, 28 and wounded nearly 80 in 1871. But of course gun cotton then also stood at a cutting edge of photographic technology. Mixed with ether and alcohol it formed collodion, cornerstone of the wet collodion process popularized by Frederick Scott Archer in 1851. Now seen this way, Bolton, the sun pictures, and that compound we now call photography all begin to appear in different terms. First, Bolton was not, or was not only, a class-conscious man of leisure. His 1860s patents show him seeking the means to achieve new kinds of motion, taking its mechanism of propulsion from Francis Pettit Smith's screw propeller and not from nature. Bolton's design drew on a model that had already compressed space and time upon the watery expanses so crucial to Imperial Britain. Second, where Smith had gone to Soho looking for an engine and finding photographs, Bolton reverses the arc. By these terms, uh, he dreams of using the speedy chemical agent of wet collodion photography to drive airplane engines. So by these terms, Bolton's apparent campaign of sabotaging his grandfather's invention of photography discloses a different target, that of blocking Smith's possession of chemical and mechanical techniques harnessed to achieve motion. Smith, the likeness of Watt, Smith, whose own screw-propelled design Bolton was simultaneously appropriating. This same Smith, who had lifted out from under the falling walls of Bolton's property chemical artifacts that appeared to bend the new time of photographic history back some half-century in advance of itself. A story like this I will freely admit, might seem too strange to yield broader lessons. Let me stress just one in closing. For Bolton's is hardly the only crossing with combustion engines to be found among key players in the early history of what we have come to call photography. Collaborating with his elder brother in 1807, Nisiphor Nieps, first photographer per a familiar estimate, obtained a brevet of 10 years duration for a combustion engine dubbed the Pire Le Four, which was used to propel a boat. Fueled by a mixture of coal dust, resins, and essential oils, the engine turned on a principle whereby aerial gas in a closed chamber yields significant energy when violently penetrated by a highly combustible substance, finely atomized and evenly distributed through it. 
By the time that the patent was renewed in 1817, the Niepce brothers had moved from efforts at replicating Senefelder's lithography on pewter plates to heliographic experiments using asphaltum and other chemical grounds employed by etchers. That path of research with bitumen of Judea and other photosensitive resins has been traced by generations of photohistorians as it leads to Niepce's collaborations with Daguerre. Yet to hear it told by even the strongest advocate in the 1860s for Niepce's photographic priority, heliographic research was but a small subsidiary to the brothers' main objective, the perfection of the mechanism and combustible chemicals for the Pirello Four. But Bolton's most important precedent in such campaigns was surely Henry Talbot himself. During the frantic years of his calotype production in the early 1840s, Talbot also obtained a sequence of patents on electrical and gas engines. Now at London Science Museum is a prototype based on Talbot's first ever patent, obtaining motive power of 1840. Rising from a nine and a half inch square base, the device's four Doric columns enclose a glass cylinder and brace a piston that turns a flywheel. The machine apparently worked like this. An alternating current carried through electrodes connected to a voltaic battery underneath the base would evolve oxygen and hydrogen gases from the diluted sulfuric acid housed in the cylinder. Those gases would push up a piston to exert motive force. Dismissed as extremely dangerous by its few modern interpreters, the device's fabricator thought otherwise. Quote, I am confident that a facsimile of this on a larger scale would propel a boat on a river or a carriage on a railroad, so Talbot was told in 1842. But by 1846, Talbot had moved from liquid chemicals to solid fuels. Ignited by a charge communicated from a galvanic battery through the metal wire, or Z, this curving line in the diagram, the chemicals would explode up to drive the piston P, thus turning a crank and flywheel in Talbot's 1846 engine design. And just as Bolton would do in 1864, Talbot identified a preparation ideal for packing into those combustion chambers. Quote, the substance of most convenient application is now that commonly known by the, by the name of gun cotton. What might all this tell us? Academic oil paintings and their replicas, calotypes, combustion-driven airplanes, wet collodion photographs, that array looks strange if we think the camera obscura is the chamber that matters here. A better way is to defamiliarize, to dissolve photography, to shift the target of investigation. A mind artifact is suggestive here. Expanding on Hiroshi Sugimoto's History of History exhibition at, Japan's, at New York's Japan Society in 2005, critic Walter Ben Michaels has influentially cast the fossil as supreme expression of what he takes to be photography's indexical ontology. Quote, if you have the fossil of a sea lily colony, then you know the colony played the same causal role in the making of the fossil that the fossil itself would play in the making of a photograph of the fossil. Unquote. But by seeing photography, painting, and engine research together, our inquiries might shift from fossils to fossil fuels, from fossils' charismatic figure to the extractive petrochemical grounds from which pictures and engines operated. To say it a different way, the sun pictures are not photographs at all. Instead, they are moves in a history of making and thinking with chemicals valued for enacting new kinds of motion in space and time. Milton Friedman once described economists' notoriously stylized models as providing an engine to analyze the world, not a photographic reproduction of it. The sun pictures turn Friedman's terms around. They challenge us to parse the historical trajectories of chemical research shared between the camera and the combustion chamber, between photography, painting, and devices of motive force modeled after the steam engine. When coining or helping to coin the term Anthropocene in 2002, chemist Paul Crutzen had the steam engine in mind as well. He dated the advent of humanity's force on the global climate to 1784, the year in which James Watt patented the steam engine's application to rotative motion. I hasten to add that the inconvenient imbrications of picture making with the literal engines and engineers of global warming, whether or not we choose to embrace the controversial Anthropocene term and narrative, 
uh, these stories pass in virtual silence among historians of photography. Again, by retrieving them, my aim is not to contribute to a greater understanding of photo history, but to make a new analytical object, the temporally evolving chemical object, as a contribution to what I have come to think of as an elemental art history. What th might that mean? As sketched here, I think it entails following not or not only the money, but the chemicals. True, I have scarcely even gestured to major questions, the links between, say, the synthetic chemistry of gun cotton, the growth of petrochemical extraction, the role of big oil in contemporary arts manufacture and display. But my point is that an elemental approach would aim to apprehend those ways in which the fine and industrial arts move together, how they are literally made of the same stuff. That approach does not require us to deny differences between an oil painting by Joshua Reynolds and a motor oil to adapt Marcel Duchamp's infamous plans for a Rembrandt. What it does mean is that we are willing to pursue historical understanding of why, when, and how Reynolds' replicas, sun pictures, wet collodion photographs could all look like they offered clues to the improvement of combustion engines as Matthew Pierce Watt Bolton was able to hold in the 1860s. An elemental art history would challenge us, moreover, to grapple with a slippery world of dreams wherein chemicals prompting reflection on the nature of time in the long 18th century now count among the artificial markers the techno-fossils of the Anthropocene's new planetary time. Exemplary work in these directions is underway, as I think this conference has demonstrated so convincingly. But in the era of alternative facts, my conviction is that we need simpler, more direct ways of showing how the material drives that have made the arts of the modern world are also the makings of a world on fire. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. It's lovely, it's lovely to be back. Thank you also for the opportunity to think about something that is not cotton, which is what takes up most of my life at the moment. Um, so the work I'm going to be talking about is something I've been thinking about from my position in both African American studies and art history. And so I, I want to, to take this opportunity to reflect on on mining as, as a kind of um, metaphor and also ha as it relates to some of the, some of the ways um, art historians like me think about, uh, go about doing the sort of historical work of, of reading images. Buried in the dirt is a small rusted plaque. Its metallic surface is mottled with flaking shades of brown, gray and red. It blends smoothly with its surroundings, the clotted earth of an English farm. The sides of the plaque lift up slightly, the thickened ridge creating a space just the right size for a walker to stub their toe against, which is actually how you might come across this plaque, by literally stumbling across it, filling out its hard edges, rising distinctively from the softer dirt. Composed from above, the view we have here is that of a walker, looking closely down, following the tread of our shoes, noticing the raised surface imprinted with old shaft. A city dweller, Zanzibar-born artist, uh, Ingrid, sorry, Guyanese-born artist, Ingrid Pollard, who's based in London, completed a year-long residency uh, called Rural Visual Arts and Rural Communities in 2013. Like many landscape artists before her, Ingrid came upon this industrial scene while walking through the open moorland surrounding High Green Manor in Tarset, North Thine in, at North Tyne in Northumberland, an area once heavily used for coal mines. Ingrid created works during this residency um, and led photography workshops where she was able to experiment with different forms of photographic technology. The final product uh, of her 12-month stay was called Regarding the Frame, and it, it was an assemblage of monotype prints uh, and digital photography that focused on the changing landscape of the area and its history of mining. And she made as many works, and I'm just going to focus on a, a prints and the photographs. She also made photo books and um, other things too, but um, this is, I'll just focus on really two, two of those works. Old shafts were significant subjects of British landscape painting, uh, material monuments to technological intervention in the British countryside, and markers of industrial progress. In this graphite study, finished in watercolour, plumes of smoke rise from the centre, 
obscuring the background while drawing attention to the activity in the foreground. We see machinery, the spoil, the unused uh, waste of rock and minerals collected in the centre, while around the earth is burrowed and cut through, strangely emptied. Pollard's photograph uh, reworks these semiotics of landscape painting. Rocks and vegetation manifest the shifting elements of nature, while the effects of industry are literally spelled out. To rehearse a cliched description, the plaque is both sign and signifier of a buried history, no longer visible, perhaps, but still embedded in the land itself. And this is something that uh, Ingrid talks about when she discusses this work, just how strong this sense of, a, of history is in the community. Um, the open moorland of Tarset, uh, she says, ho holds that history close. She describes um, music, you know, working with music groups like the Unthanks, who are a folk, a folk uh, band, who continue to sing the folk songs uh, of the area. Their songs very often drawing inspiration from miners' songs, and, and this is a, um, the testimony of Patience Kershaw was an important testimony from the 1840s of a young girl who worked in the mines and was used in um, reports to, you know, highlight the conditions beneath the surface. Um, the land f also revealed its history to Pollard in other ways. During her walks through the open moorland, co Pollard collected uh, sheep skulls, leaves, rocks, but also carb sorry, my pronunciation, also carbon of carb <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I've been practicing this. Carboniferous fossils, remind, reminders of the age of coal and mementos of the changing landscape and imprints of time. Fascinated by the process of fossilization by which coal is created, alongside her photograph, she created this series of embossed prints depicting the objects, especially the fossils that she had collected. Shown in relief, their composition was made to imitate that of coal itself um, and to evoke that sense of uh, of material being created from the accumulation of layers of time um, and substrate. So my aim in this talk really is to reflect and historicize this concept of layering in relation to Ingrid Pollard's work, but also think a little more broadly about its implications for uh, a field such as um, African American art history or black, black diasporic art history and black studies in which the questions of uh, relationships of history to experiences of place continue to be Im important themes. Uh, Pollard um, is interested, or her work in general is, I think, focuses on how and what meanings the natural world can hold. Or another way of putting it might be, she's interested in how meaning is, ex is extracted from the land um, and how that is extraction is transformed into image. And one of the ways she works through this is by walking. And during her time um, in Tarset, Ingrid was very interested in drawing participants' attention to the formulations by which the natural world comes into view. She restaged the 19th century artist's walk through the countryside, directing her participants to slow down, to stop, and look at the land, often using a handheld clawed glass. As they walked and took pictures, Pollard invited them to think, not about their connection with the land, but to see its unfamiliarity, to see it differently by focusing on what they might overlook and what might be hidden. And in doing so, come to understand how conceptions of place are constructed and also understand how photography is a process. And in light of this, we might think of Pollard's use of photography too as a form of extraction, that a process um, that has to materialize what is unseen and what is hidden. Now, the concept of hidden histories is a central framework in black studies and, and it was coined by cultural theorist Stuart Hall, drawing on Franz Fanon, um, to talk about this kind of excavation of histories uh, as a direct response to the ways colonialism distorted, um, disfigured and destroyed the past of oppressed groups. So we, mining um, in this context suggests a way of, of of, ex of excavating, of bringing to light continuities between past and present, which were months suppressed. And in earlier works, um, such as Pastoral Interlude, Pollard explored this relationship between the hidden histories of landscape and nation to interrupt associations between space, belonging, and identity. 
This was made in the context of urban social upheaval, class tension and the neoliberal politics of Thatcherism in the early 80s and it explored the aesthetic dualism of the urban versus the rural in relation to social constructions of difference and belonging. Using image and text, I mean these are just some of the um, sort of other images that were circulating at the time um, that, uh, that Pollard made these landscapes. Um, using image and text to interrupt associations between constructions of race and space, landscape art and national identity, Pollard highlighted how the problem, or the, the problem of blackness as it was conceptualized in British politics at the time. And here I just want to point out that this problem also encompassed uh, the striking coal miners right, in 80, 84, 85, um, was also a failure of aesthetics, a failure to not see nor account for Britain's colonial past. In pastoral interludes, I think photography becomes, for Pollard, something to do with bringing something out of the surface, bringing something out of the land. Um, but what I want to think about here in regarding the frame is how we might think of uh, photography as taking us below, so mining as a way of moving be beneath the surface rather than necessarily bringing something out. So as, an, an, as is common in much of Pollard's work, there's an emphasis on texture in, in her photographs. Stalks of hay are scattered over the surface here and describe a series of straightened vectors that give the surface uh, a poignant charge. Their repetition and reinforcement of each other reminds me of magnetic filings, holding their shape and bristling while doing so, as if they could reform at any minute. Beneath small rocks, of an, uh, which are of an assortment of size and colour, uh, their weight is given more substance too by this large rock at the print's right corner. Between these arrangements, small clumps of heather and grass grow in crimson, green and brown, their stalks pushing up like flowering mandalas. In the centre of this textual design is the plaque, its four corners weighted down by, by rusted screws. In the shifting colours of the Earth's geology, we see the temporal shifts of seasons, and the photograph reveals its composi compositional structure as a juxtaposition of nature with culture, of metals and vegetation. There is a sense of compression here, the energy of animate and inanimate objects coalescing, as if Pollard has somehow managed to capture an imprint of time itself. The dualisms evoked uh, in this photograph, I think, um, permeated British landscape art too of the 19th century. Mining, and especially coal mining, is a potent yet buried history of this aesthetic form. Faced with political instability on the continent and the encroaching vices of industrialization, artists and writers sought sol solace in the lesser explored regions of the, British, um, of the British Isles. But in their desire for wild romantic countryside, they also encountered the spectacle of industrial revolution, powerfully articulated in the scene of the mine. Artists struggled to adequately conceptualise the mine as an aesthetic object, struggling to work through the dualisms of nature and culture, land and technology. Visually, the mine could be incorporated back into the natural world through the language of the picturesque, as we see in this idyllic scene, where industry does not disrupt the Earth's surface, but organically merges with it um, into, ele into the elements as clouds of steam, despite the iron and coal mining taking place nearby. The extractive power of, of mining, of course, reaches the sublime in a, in a painting like this, um, which show the smouldering furnaces of Colebrookdale, which was a center of industrial revolution and, um, and iron foundries. Here, the foundries create a spectacle of the sublime that the poet Anna Seward has evoked, writing, through the coil dales, while red the countless fires, darking the summer's sun with columns large, of thick sulphur smoke which spread like pals. When the artist Thomas Harrison Hare also visited the north of England, he noticed first just how the coal mines marked the surface of both land and water. He writes, the face of the, of the country is thickly studded with engine houses and coal heaps attached to their respective pits, from which at night the sky is irradiated by a ruddy glow visible for miles around where the flaming heaps themselves are seen, 
appealing like the baleful watchfires of an immense army. And I, I'll let you read the rest, but I think Hare's description is interesting in the way it traces this powerful imprint of technology on the natural world as an unassailable force of progress marching onward. Yet there's also the sense of unease and ambivalence as the earth is transformed, constricted into new shapes, develops new textures and has turned different colours. Another photograph that Pollard made um, for regarding the frame traces, I think, some of these undulations of time on a tree trunk. Brown ridges snake around and shift the surface, which is mottled by spots of white lichen. Both photographs create this impression of looking from above, but their surface never quite flattens out entirely, as if their elements were pushing up and out of the, out of the um, surface of the photograph itself. Here, the textures of the trunk create a sense, I think, of, ge of geological time, as if we're seeing the gradations of the earth uh, reveal itself. I think um, this photograph reminds me too of the, of the 19th, 19th century uh, depictions of mining that provided artists, ge geologists, scientists, and philosophers with a new conception of the earth through new ways of understanding um, time and the, the social, sorry, the, um, the geological formation of, of the land itself. Authors and illustrators found different ways of materializing this, these gradations as a site of multiple layers and the changing makeup of, of the earth and of time. From below, the earth could be seen from multiple positions. Um, and one of, the, one of the ways I find most fascinating, this is from John Pepper's The Playbook of Metals. And, you know, I, I was really taken by the way he's sort of conceptualizing the surface of the earth as a kind of library. Um, you know, through these, these books. Um, from below, the earth could be seen from multiple positions as if time itself was held in suspension. And here, this is a, another illustration. I think maybe Amy had, had a similar one yesterday, but you can see the, um, the, the remains of a fossilized tree at the bottom as that they're cutting away. If these, um, if these early landscape representations, sorry, if these landscapes, in these landscape representations, I think the problem of representing mining is not just about its disruption to the surface, but it's a problem of representing the earth itself as a repository of meaning, of history, and of time. Mining mediated a very particular physical encounter with the world that reorientated the ways people could move through it, saw it, and lived within it. As a form of extraction, it materialized a set of social relations between humans and the natural world, demarcating forms of access and spatial experience. So while my mining transformed the appearance of the surface, it also challenged artists' ability to accurately depict these transformations because it also existed um, below. So although artists like Kotman might use the material allotropes of coal, here graphite, to render their studies and sketches, they, could re they rarely showed what took place beneath these mine shafts, at least not in, this, um, in uh, exhibition spaces. But artists did enter the mines in other ways. Their sketches were translated into woodcuts, engravings, and etchings. And it does seem, you know, while these were more easily reproducible um, as technologies of of representation, it does seem significant here to point out that these techniques materialize what was unavailable to the naked eye uh, through a process of surface excoriation, rather like the mines um, they represented. The experience of entering the mine was both terrifying and exhilarating for Hare. A descent into the darkness, to the dark heart of the earth, Hare states, Few persons, even those resident in the coal district, are possessed of sufficient nerve to enter a pit. Without ocular proof, however, it is difficult adequately to conceive either the wonders or the horrors of the scene. Below the ground, humans face the elements in altogether new ways, and artists like, um, like Harrison and sorry, artists like Hare and writers like Pepper describe its vast uh, labyrinthine caverns and the claustrophobic tunnels. One breathes differently here too, faced always with the threat of poisonous gases or combustion. The view from below ground was both disorientating and sometimes beyond description. But as artists walked and observed and sketched above, 
what they noticed was that their movements were tracked underground. Um, as artists walked, coal workers, many of them children, burrowed, bent and pulled. Because of their size, of course, children were ideal, miner, uh, ideal mine workers. Um, but buried deep, their bodies softened and their bones bowed, often taking on the, the shape of the, the, the tunnels they were with, embedded within. As artists descended, their descriptions of working conditions um, illustrated, helped to illustrate government reports and newspaper articles that agitated for industrial reform. And in particular, um, one of the, the main aspects of industrial reform sorry, um, was focused not just on the, the conditions facing all mine workers, but on, on the conditions facing the young girls and women who went down, which revolved around um, their close proximity to, to grown men and the fact that they were very often almost naked while they were down there working. So this, there was also um, a tension here about ideas of, of femininity and, and labour um, to which, you know, that challenged many middle class conceptions of, um, of, of gender. Artists brought light to these dark places, in a sense, um, places that often became the site of entombments and death. Newspaper reports um, and playbills like the, uh, sorry, and pamphlets like these reported mining explosions, fires and collapses, and n stories as well about miners digging up the bones of their dead colleagues um, as they tunneled through were also common. But when miners did emerge from the pits, they emerged blackened and blurred. Their skin thickened, their frames misshapen. Even once they reached the surface, it seemed, their very bodies continued to betray their position below ground. Mining then as a form of material extraction is an antagonistic process, always in tension with the, in intention with the extraction of labour. And while middle class commentators often made comparisons between the refinement of industrial metalwork with the refinement of industrial labour, they still had to face the reality that mining had created a class of people whose agitation and autonomy often challenged their conception of a harmonious social order. The blackened bodies of miners, often described as another kind of human species, I think also helped draw attention to a semiotics of blackness that might reconceptualise uh, the, the metropole or Britain in relation to the colonies. Jeff Quilly, for example, has argued that we need to maybe look more closely at um, artists like George Robertson, who made, uh, who made illustrations of prints and paintings of both coal workers and plantations in the Caribbean. Um, to think more about how Robertson, someone like Robertson, might have been thinking about the relationship between the enslaved and the labouring body. Um, and this, these are two, two uh, prints that he talks about. Um, and he argues that you know, we might see some similarities here in the ways that coal workers and enslaved, enslaved people are demarcated through the contrast of shadow and light um, in, his, in his printmaking. But this relationship between miners and the enslaved might be thought of in other ways too. The raw material of coal was found in the heart of empire, unlike, say, something like cotton, which was a raw material that had to be shipped in. It was not brought in from the colonies, and yet it fueled, um, it fueled the industrial production that went out from, from England into the colonies. In particular, it fueled the production of iron. Coal was, uh, and I'm quoting pep uh, Pepper here, coal was, was an element in the transformation of, um, of metal and the transformation of black people into raw material. It was an integral component in the commodification and circulation of enslaved Africans as a form of liquid value across the Atlantic. Iron neck and leg rings, uh, iron, um, they're called punishment, punishment rings or forms of torture, bound black people on plantations, on auction blocks, in slave forts. In the, slave, in the holds of slave ships too, iron ballasts were used to offset the, their weight, the weight of their cargo to enable the ship to float. And here too, I wonder if we can't make a little more of a visual connection through coal and iron between the subterranean space of the mine to the hold of the ship 
which could be connected, as um, Christina Sharp has recently written, by the brutal arithmetic of black death. In other words, I'm interested in what this view from the underside of the landscape can offer us and how it can offer us another viewpoint, a, a subterranean space from which to see both across space but also through time. To see from below is to be with the buried, to understand the landscape through its social relations that remain embedded with it. And one of the things that, um, that Pollard talks about when she's when she speaks about the, or thinks about when she was speak, talking about the, this particular photograph, is also um, to, think, to think about other, other ways, other ways of, this, of understanding industrial labor in contemporary British um, society and in contemporary British constructions of the British landscape. And she was thinking too of the uh, 2004 cockle, uh, cockle worker disaster where I think 20 Chinese, um, workers that, who were virtually enslaved were drowned as they were picking cockles from the, from the coast just above Preston. Um, and this is a monument to, um, to the workers there. And that is a, um, there's a still here from Nick Broomfield's film and also from Isaac Julian, um, another British artist, uh, sorry, American artist film. On, on this, but she's, she's thinking very much about how these contemporary histories of labor and, and trafficking also remain embedded uh, in the British landscape. To see from below then is also to think about access and location. If these earlier histories, um, if these earlier histories are erased, like how then do we see figures in the land and space now? How do we think about home? How do we think about uh, constructions of the alien? Mining then for Pollard is a, social, is a spatial practice, essentially, I think, a viewing position. And I want to just conclude now um, by, by pushing a little more at this idea of a viewing position um, and, to, and to go back to coal. Ironically, or perhaps not, both the mine and the slave ship, mine workers and the enslaved are in their own way paradoxical figures of modernity, each exemplifying a unique set of social relations around material extraction and value articulated and refined through the language of progress. And it was not lost on 19th century commentators right, that their vision of progress was symbolized by the expanding, by this expanding, symbolized by the expanding industry, um, you see here shipping, rail, um, rail, railways. This expanding industry was of course underpinned by the most primitive of substances, which was coal. And it was, it was in a sense, coal's very primitivism not its preciousness that made it such a subject of fascination. So if mining unearthed the Earth's geology, coal seemed to hold that time in suspension, providing artists and consumers and geologists with something like a portal into the Earth and humanity's history. And I quote here from John Henry Pepper again from his playbook of metals. He says, how many little things out of the Earth, such as hatchets and spearheads, knives and pottery, Supply the learned antiqui antiquary with the light, which discloses the doings of our forefathers. Why, if brass ornaments, etc., betray the ancient haunts of men, the numerous remains of plants and stems of species found in the coal and coal measure surely reveal the vegetable origin of coal and tell us how this mineral fuel holds the remains of vast forests and other large groups of innumerable plants. And describing the fossilized remains um, embedded in coal, Pepper makes comparisons between the Carboniferous vegetation um, and that of a forest in the West Indies, actually, constructing coal as a kind of miniature landscape in, with both, in which both time and space coalesce. Or rather, he's careful to point out how coal emerges from this accumulation of shifting vegetation over time. So coal, then, was a kind of petrified landscape that held, for at least for its 19th century viewers, both the past and the future within it. It was, one might say, or it provided a way of looking at place and time from underneath. And this accumulative register of coal, I think, returns us to Pollard's, particularly her monotype prints, which in their texture and their subject um, as a form of embossing, are also attempts to visualize 
the land itself um, as a process of accumulation of, and of, mat of matter and time. I think this sense of layering is also more pronounced in earlier works by, by Pollard. This is her work, Landscape Trauma, where she created microscopic landscapes to, to evoke this ge geological effect. These are also, she reminded me recently, organic suspensions. Their swirling colour and undulated surface imitating the alchemy of photography, materialising it as a te technology of reproduction in which the image appears on the surface through the admixture and accumulation of chemical compounds and inorganic material. Bringing light, materialising and bringing us beneath the surface, Pollard, I think, is trying to create a resonance in a way between the artist as miner. And mining becomes then a form of unearthing in, a, in her work, a spatial practice and a viewing position that holds in suspension multiple layers of matter and meaning. Thank you. I feel I've drawn the um, short straw, not because I'm speaking last, but I've got to speak after those two great papers. Um, this, this is um, really a paper about a, an idea that I think runs through all of art, so it's a sort of universalist paper, which is the idea of mining. So four um, propositions of mining, that mining extracts the earth's hidden secrets, mining undermines, a mine is an explosive device, and mining is how much of value comes into the world. Now, the origin of this um, elaborately decorated metalwork in a mine is rarely factored into cultural history discourses. Though an exhibition titled Mining the Museum, we might expect an echo of this um, repressed origin. However, the exhibition's title uh, was a metaphor and addressed an intellectual rather than um, materialist economy. Nevertheless, the metaphor, the metaphor points to a scene, uh, sorry, to some striking parallels I'm sort of at that age where I don't know whether I should be wearing glasses, glasses or not. I'll try. Uh, some striking parallels in how we linguistically imagine um, the two economies, that is the intellectual economy and the materialist economy, which has been crossing over these last two days. In mining the museum at the Maryland Historical Society in Baltimore, Fred Wilson, who was responsible for the, action, for the exhibition, First of all, dug out things that had been buried in its archive, bringing them into the open to reveal formerly concealed secrets. And two, undermined the ideology or logic that had hitherto ordered its displays. That is, its normative story of white privilege was deconstructed. And then further, or thirdly, mining the museum had an explosive impact, igniting the so-called archival turn of contemporary art. So that's just sort of echoing those four materialist propositions of mining that I began with, these four intellectual propositions, they're sort of direct echoes. Wilson's sites um, were also on deeper seams of museological discourse than the ideology of his displays, and that's what I want to um, dig down into, if I can use a metaphor myself. He sought to show how museums think and what the epistemological and even ontological limits of this thinking are. In this respect, Mining the museum enacted what Heidegger called an unconcealment or the opening of a being to the world, in this case, the being of a museum. Now, according to Heidegger, this opening occurs within an aesthetic economy. I'm sorry to chuck all you, these economies at you, but that's the overarching <laughs> theme, um, which brings us closer to the ethical and materialist concerns of this uh, particular conference, but also um, to more metaphysical concerns that, um, that have sort of occasionally been touched on these last two days as well. Now, unconcealment is Heidegger's literal translation of the ancient Greek word althea, which is usually translated as truth. A and it's a central concept in his essay, The Origin of the Work of Art. Which, and, and, and Heidegger had coined the term um, about 10 or 15 years earlier to denote the furtive, na what he saw as the furtive nature of truth, forever caught in an insolvable conflict between what can be revealed and what should be concealed. That truth can never wholly, can never really wholly show itself. 
um, what he described as a quote, the opposition which exists within the essence, within the essence of truth between clearing and concealment. By clearing, he means, you know, revealing. Whatever truth is, it is delimited by the how, when and where of its presencing, by the circumstances of its unconcealment. That's his sort of basic argument. So, uh, like the term deconstruction, I think um, Derrida's term deconstruction comes from Heidegger's term unconcealment, the, there's a double register in the terms which turns against itself, describing the circling movements and truths coming into view, unsure of how much it can reveal in its showing. So that, um, so because truth can only show itself in the folds of an event, it is always a performative rather than a fixed state, and a secret always remains. And, and this, of course, is evident, I think, in, um, in what I'm calling Wilson's aesthetic judgments, or you might call it his curatorial judgments. For example, when we look at that scene, it's very easy not to see the slave shackles. He places them in such a way, and he does this. He did this throughout his, throughout his. Um, I'll just I'll just call it an exhibition. You never know whether to call him a curator or an artist here. He he, he did this throughout, so that, so that, um, so that the secret remains a little bit hidden. It's like a worm unseen in the apple until we bite into it. And so, I'm now. Jumping to this work, so to talk a little bit more about um, Heidegger's notion of unconcealment. The aesthetic and metaphysical economies of unconcealment, I think, are exemplified in Ambromovich and Ule's first night sea crossing performance, which occurred at the Art Gallery of New South Wales here in 1981. The 16-day um, performance was the outcome of a four-month investigation of indigenous telepathic communication in Central Australia during the summer of 1980 and 81. The telepathic performance included four props, a table, and you can see the close-ups there. Those, those are half a dozen white things, just the reflections of the lights in there. So a table um, and three, what they saw uh, as spiritually vibrant things, gold nuggets they had mined in the desert, a gold gilded boomerang and a diamond black python, uh, which I think they just picked up in Sydney somewhere. Um, because that's where the, pyth that's where the pythons come live. Um, in extracting or drawing the latter three things out from the earth and bringing them into a clearing, the clearing here being the table, their performance artwork was an event that, to use a mining metaphor from Heidegger, quoting Heidegger, moves the earth into the open of a world and holds it there. Moves the earth into the open of a world and holds it there. Uh, that's sort of what Anna was, I suppose, talking about. There's a few more other crossovers <laughs> between the, our papers too. Now the Night Sea Crossing performance is re-performed in Amsterdam um, two years later in 1983, this time just with a gold gilded circular table. Um, but her props were a Pintipi man they had met in Central Australia and a Tibetan Lama um, that they, uh, like the python, they just picked up in Amsterdam. Um, now the Pintipi man, Pintipi man, Charlie Jungarai, was also a founding artist of Papunya Tula and some years later made a painting over here um, that I've speculated elsewhere actually referenced this performance. If you look closely, you can see the four chairs, the four, um, they're slightly different white, deeper white, you know, around the, the table. Um, um, uh, this, so th uh, I've speculated that this painting has actually referenced that, but th it also references his own um, dreaming, which is the ice dreaming, but it's called um, an audience with the Queen. He never met the Queen, but I'm um, expecting it's the ice queen, and Brom Marina Abramovich, <laughs> that he's perhaps referring to. Um, now, Heidegger's phlo philosophy of unconcealment also resonates with the archaeology of archaic art practices. Mining is the origin of art because extracted from the first mines was the means to make art in the literal sense that the first material mined was ochre, which was the primary ingredient in paint. This, this here is the oldest known continuously used mine in the world, estimated to have been in operation for more than 30,000 years and apparently still going. However, most indigenous ochre mines 
Um, however, most indigenous ochre mines were much more modest affairs, dug from small excavations or from exposed outcrops that didn't so obviously scar the earth. The important point was not the size of the mine, but the authenticity of its site, that the ochre had been left there by an ancestral being. Also important was the medium in which the ochre was made, the important, the paint that is. So the paint had been made from ochre that had been left there by an ancestral being. Um, and also the medium in which the ochre was mi mixed, which was fat extracted from the totemic animal of the, an of the ancestor. And also the ancestral relations of the surface up surfaces upon which the paint was applied. All these things had to come together. Be those surfaces human bodies, particular rock, important ancestral rock sites, or bark cut from trees. These um, ancestral relations is what put the spring in the dancer's step or the, the flash in the painting, if you like. Now, two very famous um, Western Arnhem Land artists, Yura Waller and Moanjul. You can see Moanjul's art, yeah. yeah. And uh, Yura Waller is the sort of where Moanjul's art comes from. Now, trees, with their roots in the ground, trees also mine the earth for its agency. That's the importance of bark as a support for painting. So it's where the trees are that's important for the bark that comes off the trees. Dead trees, their core eaten out by ants, were also used as burial poles in which the bones of the deceased were ochred and placed. As the hollow log decayed, the ochred bones were returned to the earth from which the spirit came, thus, thus completing the cycle. So the whole metaphysics here in the origin of mining is basically what I'm arguing. Um, so the ochre enriched fat was not now the ochre enriched fat was not just rubbed on the body, rock or tree willy nilly, but also in the particular form and rhyme of an ancestral design. The designs were appropriated from those found in rock shelters which ancestral, ancestral beings had left there long ago, as if an archive or memorial of their lives, and were also sung into being with songs ancestors had given shaman and dreams. So a little bit like, like what Anna was saying, coal is. They, they, they are um, something that was left there long ago, something that's very ancient and ancestral. So at every stage, ancestral relations obligate and legitimise the extraction of the earth's fruits and its transformation into art. Water holes, trees, rock shelters, ochre mines and dreams are each openings or clearings through which ancestral truths are unconcealed or brought into the open. In Heidegger's scheme, the intervention of humans um, to make these clearings or art was a prerequisite for, for unconcealment or for truth to be shown. He described it, Heidegger described it as a two-way appropriation. Artists receive the ancestral songs and designs from the earth and then the art throws the spirit out into the world. In this way, being, he says, redoubles itself. It's a... It's a um, form of, of, the, of the way in which truth reproduces itself through art or through humans. Or to coin Derrida's term, uh, re, sorry, in this way being redoubles itself to coin Derrida's term and only through this redoubling, said Heidegger, um, and here's a little quote, can being be present as being, that is, become present. Both are mutually appropriated, extended as a gift one to the other. Only the entry into the realm of this mutual appropriation determines and defines the experiences, the experience of thinking, or we might, we might say um, creating or making art. In this way, Heidegger establishes an ethics of aesthetics, or we might say an ethics of mining, in which the artist is obliged, or if you like, coerced, to create a clearing, to mine the ochre and cut the tree. Thus the origin of mining lies in a sense of kinship with the earth. And because of this, a corresponding obligation to appropriate its fruits in various aesthetic gestures. This archaic aesthetic impulse at the origin of mining and harvesting um, is, is, I would argue, echoes through art until today. And I think we've seen lots of examples of it. But I'm going to just give you a couple. For example, in um, 1971, at the Walpri settlement of Uendamu in Central Australia, sacred designs from ceremonial caves several hundred miles away were appropriated into an artificial cave 
um, using commercial paint so that initiation ceremonies could be conveniently performed on the edge of the settlement without interrupting the new demands of modernity. At the same time, in the nearby settlement of Papania, in fact at exactly the same time, in the same month, um, in the, um, similar designs were appropriated onto boards and canvases, also with commercial paint. As with traditional paint, commercial paint is the product of mining. The sheen, what um, they loved about the commercial paint was the sheen, which was similar to the oil, which is, um, which is of course de derived from petrochemical origins. Um, and and, and this, it's because it emulated the fat, which was considered a, as a sign of the spirit or the ancestor actually being in the design. But the potency of these paintings was due to the power of their appropriation, the appropriation of, of their design, but also their appropriation of all those other things that I've mentioned. The commercial paint is appropriating traditional paint, the look of traditional paint, for example. Within a decade, the Papunya canvases were being exhibited in biennales as contemporary art and had become a primary source of income as well. So that, you know, the economic vector is there as well. Now, these two developments in Central Australia echo the role of the archive in other modern art. So I'm, I, I've always argued this is really modern art that we're looking at now. And they echo, echo um, yeah, the role of the archive or of appropriating the archive in modern art in which art museum was conceived as a mine for the artist to either appropriate like, or like many modernists um, explosively undermine. Either way, modern art production remains inside the metaphysics of mining and redoubling or appropriation. For example, and there's a wonderful crossover here with the first paper with Matthew's paper. For example, Britain's Royal Art Academy, which was founded in 1768 and was a moving force in the creation of the modern museum, was a secluded initiation ground in which aspiring artists appropriated designs from the old masters or their ancestral beings in order to rejuvenate them. Now Joshua Reynolds, the first president of the Royal Academy, was a prolific collector of the art of the old masters. Not only did he appropriate their designs, he literally excavated their paintings, as you can see here, rubbing and scraping away layers of paint to uncover the secrets um, I, I now realise of their, of their chemical <laughs> makeup, of their techniques, as well as remaking or improving them, as Indigenous artists have done for millennia on rock art. And, uh, so, you know, a recent conservation of these, of these paintings have revealed, have revealed the amount of work that uh, Reynolds did on that very famous Rembrandt, he virtually repainted the whole thing. And the other painting, this painting apparently is just totally, totally, this Rembrandt's actually all by Reynolds, the whole, the whole painting. Um, so Reynolds and Wilson each operated within the confines of a re relatively limited archive. However, whereas Reynolds sought to uncover the secrets of these codes, Wilson aimed to deconstruct them. Today, we call it decolonizing the museum. You can read that. You can, if you've got two ears, you can listen to me and read, or eyes and ears. Decolonizing the museum might seek to reform and even recode normative aesthetic practices, but it keeps in place the museum archive as the site of the law. All that changed in mining a museum was what one could and couldn't be said. What, what, uh, what he decided of truth to reveal and of what of truth to conceal again. It was, or in indigenous speak, what was inside and what was outside. There was a sort of a shuffling going on there. In making the museum's archive the horizon of what can be thought, Wilson playing the archivist delimits what is possible, um, what is possible to the content of the archive, of the archive that he chooses to deconstruct, thus confirming Foucault's point that the archive is the first law. With limited resources, he adopts the tactics of the bricoleur, another genre of indigenous art, appropriating and remixing existing signs. Instead of fashioning new signs, existing ones are put into new relations or contexts, which dare to pronounce as the defining characteristic of discourse. And this, of course, is the, the raison d'etre of, of, of the appropriation art movement of the 1980s the quintessential art movement of postmodernism, of which Wilson's Mining the Museum is really just a late example. 
Now, of the, uh, of the appropriation artist, the one who most assiduously foreshadowed, I think, Wilson's mining, museum mining is Imance Tillers. Not because he sets out to decolonise a museum, but because since 1991 he has in his ongoing book project, Book of Power project, put a vast number of artworks into new relations and new and redoublings. Now Tillers doesn't, like Wilson did in Mining and Museum, restrict his lease, his mining lease if you like, to the limited collection of a single museum. Instead he surveys the comparative infinitude of the expanded museum that privilates in art books, catalogues and journals and now the internet, something akin to Malraux's Museum Without Walls. Here the mine has been relocated from the immediate ideological context that interests Wilson and I suppose those who want to decolonise particular museums to the metaphysical context of the symbolic order, Le Musée Imaginaire, in which all the world's art is buried, decentered, and waiting to be extracted and put into new conversations. Now Tillers is a convenient point on which to conclude this talk because his first work, his first artwork, his origin point, if you like, returns us explicit, explicitly to what might be called an aesthetics of extraction. Here, at the bedrock of his art practice, can also be unearthed his architectural honours thesis supervised by Terry Smith at the University of Sydney. I've tried to bring you guys in as much as I can, even though I'm from Melbourne, uh, in 1973, which examined the new systems orientated theories of conceptual, of conceptual art and earth art. In 1972, immersed in conceptualism, Tillis conceived what he considered, what he now considers his first artwork. He obviously did artworks before this, but this is his first, what he considers his first artwork. Initially performed on a beach, in Sydney in 1972, it began with making a clearing by drawing a circle 30 feet in diameter in the sand. At opposite points on the edge of this clearing, two small identical tents were erected. You can see them there, very small. Um, were erected with one turned inside out. Extracting a shovel load of sand from under one tent, Tillis carried it one shovel, at a one shovel load at a time to the other tent, placing it inside. This action was repeated until the tent was filled with sand. At the end of the action, or the event, the clearing appeared to our eyes, w would appear to our eyes unchanged. But for those who were there, they would know that one tent was filled with sand and that under the other was a hole of equal volume of the tent, that it was unfilled. Now, I wish Tillers had called this work extraction, of course, um, but he called it enclosure which was a reference to the enclosure of the work within a clearing, within a circle or line that doubles back on itself, within a series of symmetrical repetitions, and within a systems orientated process, and also to what, one, to what was enclosed like a secret in each tent, the fullness of one uh, mirroring the emptiness of the other. The point of the work, wrote Tillers back then, was that its meaning resides not in the individual elements, but in their position within the whole system. But at this point, at the beginning of a career that then could not be predicted, he could not see that his excavation of sand from one site to another through an event of systematic and symmetrical circlings was an elegant model of Heidegger's concept of the unconcealing of being, a concept that he would later explicitly exploit in his art. Now, my first image was of the MacArthur River mine, the second largest zinc mine in the world. It has been opposed by locus, local indigenous clan, sorry, by local indigenous clans since it was first mooted in the early 1980s. Opposition continues. And they opposed it because it threatened the local white ochre kangaroo dreaming site where they mined ochre. Now, if my analysis points to a moral lesson in this dispute, it is that driving each sides is a desire to fulfill its sacred obligation to unconceal the being of the earth, each unable to recognise what its unconcealing withholds from the other. One zinc, the other ochre. And uh, on that point, we can open discussion on, on the morality of these things. Thank you. So it's really both an honor and a challenge to be respondents to these three very impressive papers. So I'll try to do my, my best. <laughs> so coal is a fossil, as uh, Anna and also Matthew have 
uh, reminded us um, that is to say coal is a progressive accumulation of strata of time, one layer over the other, materializing the continuity of times within the Earth itself, transforming the flux of time into a stock of matter, a stock into which one can then dig and excavate to turn it into flux again, into energy, movement, history. In other words, um, accumulation is um, turning profit into capital, and mining is turning capital into profit back again. When one mines the ground, the underneath strata reappear. Behind the apparent continuity of the landscape, or of accepted historical discourses, lie discontinuities, conflicting or repressed histories, points of resistance. Underneath an English landscape, one could find the unexpected history of the shared exclusive, uh, excluding blackness of coal miners and enslaved Africans. Behind paintings shown at an international contemporary art biennale, one could find deposits from ancestral Aboriginal practices. And one silver plate can condense one's grandfather's experiment, so another ancestor, and his now rejected conception of time and motion. This silver plate uh, was uncovered while mining the Soho Library. Um, of course, libraries, just like museums, are places where archives accumulate in strata in a certain order arranged. How interesting that in a perfect mise en abyme, this silver plate allegedly depicted the Soho house before its architectural renovation. That is to say, encapsulates the prehistory of its keeping place, being in a way the archive of its own archive. And that it may not represent this building after all is even more interesting. It demonstrates that the continuity or discontinuity in the arrangement of the strata of time is the crux of this dispute. Hence the politics of mining, hence the ideological and critical dimension of mining that these three papers have been addressing. Because those who master the refined technology of mining, the refined technology of turning stock into flux, are those who make history. For history is only a way of rearranging the strata of time, um, some unconcealed and other kept secret, uh, recovering or uncovering some of these strata to use up their resources to move on in a chosen direction. Therefore, to me, a central question is, who masters this powerful technology of mining who holds the patent? Who holds the camera? Who hangs the picture? Uh, who masters this exploding engine uh, that puts history in motion? So you may feel free to respond to any of this uh, comment, but I have a more specific question to each of you. Um, to Matthew, um, it seems that uh, Bolton, so the, the grandson, had to close up the discourse on photography in order to propel his own technological ambitions. Um, and this means being in a position of significant power, power over both the cultural and the technological fields. Um, so you're urging us to follow the chemical. I'm wondering if it's not also following um, the places of power from which men can appropriate these chemicals, uh, monopolize their use, and decide how um, to uh, unclose discourses. Um, to Anna, um, you're um, arguing that uh, Pollard is inventing new ways of looking, uh, new ways of walking, but also new ways of telling or recounting the history of a certain uh, landscape. So I'm wondering about the place of words, of discourse, uh, both in the actual uh, process of making images, uh, like 
discussions while walking, and also in the finished form, uh, accompanying um, the images as they are exhibited or printed into books. And to Ian, um, can mining museums, either real museums or imaginary museums, can, can mining propel us to different temporalities and potentialities, or is it just a closed loop, uh, like Taylor's enclosure, um, a closed loop of appropriating, using and wasting the same limited cultural uh, resources over and over again until total exhaustion. Uh, in other words, are our cultural resources a, a set of limited uh, and threatened resources, just as our natural resources are? Oh, great. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, Sophie. Um, that was great. Yes, the answer is uh, I totally agree. I think that when Bolton is writing about sun pictures in a series of three pamphlets, which go from seven pages to seventy-one pages to a hundred and 20 pages or something like this in a span of three years, at the same time that he's taking out these patents, he mentions nothing of his airplane patent activities in his text on sun pictures. He does acknowledge uh, Francis Pettit Smith's engineering accomplishments, but there's a certain way in which all of this is a complex alibi or something like this that is masking an appropriative and legal set of maneuvers that he's pushing into place where he is literally sending uh, the constabulary, the police, after Edward Price, who has supposedly stolen, uh, embezzled a thousand pounds from the Soho operation, and he's, you know, he completely disappears from this archive. And the exercise of power that is in operation is um, very clear. I think the, the turning this as a story into and about photography is a very clever way for him to um, rearrange and conceal his own industrial technological ambitions and to claim back that which is of chemical and mechanical and possibly technical interest to him under the pretense of a sequence of um, arguments that appear to be aesthetic, but uh, as we see, the aesthetic and the technological and the chemical and uh, the political are totally enmeshed in a situation like this. Um, yes, thank you. They were really thought-provoking comments. Um, so I think there are two ways I can answer your question about discourse. Um, the first is to say, one of the reasons behind, I mean, not, I don't think I know, one of the reasons behind Pollard's very particular engagement with histories of landscape construction and also histories of British art um, relate to this kind of failure of discourse, of that, um, a failure that a lot of artists from the early 80s that we now have been sort of termed the British Black Art Movement um, sort of talk about this lack of discourse, not, not just a, about a lack of discourse around the histories of colonialism, but the lack of discourse around conceptualising an artist as a black British person or an Asian person. So there's a way in which I think this engaging with this broader discourse of the art, his, art historical canon is another kind of spatial practice, right, making the space making. Um, but then I think the, uh, related to that, and this is something I think that Ingrid Pollard is particularly interested in and, and working through, is that she, she wants us to, to think a lot about process um, because the, the discourse that is available often focuses on the final product, which is to say, focuses on this history that is unearthed. Um, so 
as opposed to focusing on a more um, a more formal consideration of how you know she is an artist, how she is practicing. So I think discourse there then also works in relation to how you know art history is written and our criticism coalesces around some of these you know her work and, and other artists' work. Um, but in relation to this specific project regarding the frame, yes, I think she spent a lot of time walking with, um, with a poet, Carol Mackay, who knows, and she also spent a lot of time with these um, singing groups. Like she, she plays the banjo, and so she joined these kind of local folk music groups, and, um, and that was another way for her to, to ruminate and you kind know, of work through these. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say yes to, to your to your one, um, especially especially for the um, the indigenous artists I talked about that, um, that that the making of art is part of a of a continuous cycling or recycling that has to that the 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 uh, you know that the the ancestral spirits have to be. Um, I suppose Heidegger would say reperformed. Otherwise, if they're not, terrible things will happen. So, you know, ancestral beings aren't benign creatures. They'll they'll bring all sorts of catastrophic events if if this recycling st stops. It's a bit like the um, what's it called the 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 um, Atlantic Ocean, you know, if that stops, that cycling, the ice age comes. So, yeah, the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream, yeah. Um, and, and so the, the um, art performance is, is, is part of a much of a larger process, which I think goes a little bit back to what you're talking about. And that's why I want to talk about Heiger's notion of the event, you know, rather than just the, the final product. It's, it's a whole whole event thing in the temple that was something you know, that occurred to me during the session that that uh, that uh, I was trying to remember the rest of the papers but uh, our papers seem to bring in the notion of temporality into our into thinking about about mining or whatever and I, I'm not sure what thoughts I have on it yet but I thought it was a very interesting um, sort of opening that occurred the the issue of, of temporality which is sort of, of course deeply embedded in in all the things we now worry about and climate change and and all you know and and that sort of thing yeah so yeah was there was there another question then I can't remember that was it yeah so okay in strict order I think it was you're doing this deliberately to give me a workout I'm right to the back thanks. Uh, for you, Ian, um, in regard to your uh, introduction of the various uh, European or Australian artists in a talk across um, largely Indigenous cultures of Australia, um, surely there's a profound difference for immigrants to perform on in the land than there is for Indigenous artists um, as, you know, Marina Abramovic and Ule's performance was one of numerous performances done from the 1970s on by various European artists who have come particularly to the centre, to Central Australia, to rub their selves in the red dust as performances of the, the neo-primitive, as it were. And I guess I'd like to hear you uh, speak to the questions of what do you think of the ethics of that? Easy question to start with, I think. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Anne. <laughs> And that, um, yeah, I'm, well, that's how I tried to end up with, um, you know, that big mine. 
the, the ethics of that big mine up in the Northern Territory versus the um, mining uh, white ochre clay for, for um, you know, um, performances and dance and putting on the body. There's, there's just such a, a, which I think is a parallel you know, to that question. Though, of course, the mine, I think the big difference between the big mine is exactly scale, which is another thing we haven't really talked about. The, the scale of an ochre mine versus the scale of mines now is, um, is totally different. But, uh, but perhaps, perhaps you could think of it that way in the sense of the scale of the Western art world versus the scale of the, of the indigenous art world and the scale of someone like Marina Abramovich which is not, wasn't as big back then, of course. Um, um, coming into then in 1980, 81, when, uh, when um, the Papunya movement hadn't really impacted on the art world yet. You know, it was really, the yeah, Papunya movement really only started to impact after that. So it was a totally different um, sort, of, sort of scale there. And it does, I think, come back to what you were saying, Sophie, that question about power. And, and um, clearly, clearly, there's a politics of power going on here, both with um, um, Imran Stiller's uh, or the white art world and the Aboriginal art world, and that that uh, the mine and the traditional owners of that. And uh, and uh, we we can think of it in term we can think of it in terms that I've talked about, which is more sort of metaphysical terms. Well, they're both. They're both um, engaging in the same sorts of processes, but when you, as soon as you start to think of it in power, you see that, that that struggle between the traditional landowners and that big mining company is not so much, I think, a struggle for them to be able to mine their white clay. The struggle is actually to do with politics and um, and sovereignty, which is a, which is a much bigger thing. Which is which is exactly the struggle that Imance Tillers got involved in when they got you know caught up in the appropriation of, of Michael Nelson. Chagamara's work, which um, you know happened a fair bit later than the, than that. So I don't know if that answers your question, um, um, but I think that's sort of what we are in the end talking about is is um, is politics at that level, not so much art politics, but, but the politics of um, of real power. I know Matthew wanted to come in at some point. Well, uh, I was just wondering. I was struck by. <clears throat> the way in which you concluded, um, and it struck to me, it struck me that a relevant, if we're going to f include the Heideggerian <laughs> vocabulary, a relevant point of reference would be uh, the essay concerning technology, and to think of this as a move to uh, the zinc mine, to uh, uh, an engagement with the natural world as not having this uh, unconcealment in the aletheia sort of sense, but to be all about standing reserve and a transformation of the natural world into stock, to return to a term that Sophie has given us. And that would seem like uh, possibly a relevant point of way, a point of, a register in which to understand uh, the uh, Marina Abramovich picking off the shelf, as you described it, of uh, the shaman or the snake that was locally available, treating these as stock, as so much um, standing reserve to be consumed or something like this, rather than having the kinds of, uh, I won't try to summarize Heidegger, but the sorts of uh, more robust and organic relations to nature that are imagined positively in the origin of the work of art and in the technology essay that is being lost in a modern version. Yeah, well, I think um, certainly um, I'm sure Heidegger would not would be rolling in his grave if I knew I was um, comparing a mind to, to what he thought of as clearing because clearly he uh, well, you know, well, from what you, you said, that's true. That was sort of a, a real jump for that. Um, in terms of Abramovich, and you could also say the same about Tillers, not so much in that tent performance, but in his appropriations of not just Indigenous art, but non-Indigenous art, you could, you could argue a similar sort of thing that he's treating. And I think you could probably say, argue the same with, um, with Sir Joshua Reynolds and, and his um, 
you know, treating the classical tradition as, as a stock to draw on. But, um, and maybe you can also argue the same with um, the ancestral clay being mined and, and then used as paint. I'm not sure. But certainly that comes back to... It seems like that would be in the Heideggerian thing. category of the world creation and the, yeah. the making of the world that reveals the earth and that aletheia and all this. I'm not subscribing to these yeah. Heideggerian valuations, but it seems like that would be the... I was expecting you to appeal to that. Yeah, no, I didn't want to... Mechanics to... That's why I didn't want to do that, because... Because of that, you know, I mean, that, that is the sort of route to go down to. But uh, I think it does come back to a matter of scale and scale, as um, Stalin said, that really counts. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, there is a tipping point in, in scale where it does shift into a whole different quality. That, uh, I, I don't, I'm sure we're going to return which is to where the question ethics scale. comes in, you know. And, uh, yeah. And, yeah. There are many questions. If you don't mind, I, can I uh, leap to the other people patiently waiting? So, who? I think yours, Mike. Thank you. Um, my question is for Anna, and thank you so much for your beautiful paper. It's so exciting. Um, um, I responded to your comment about the semiotics of blackness and how you um, spoke so interestingly about that vertical cross-section of the mine with people buried in it and then the slave ships. I thought that was terrific, that analogy. Um, in terms of, you know, the, the body, the coal workers and enslaved peoples, um, what exactly was the demographic of the miners? Were there any people of colour in the mines? Um, thank you. I should say, so this connection, I think, between the coal mine and the slave ship, is, it's not to sort of conflate the two, obviously. Mm -hmm. I'm very aware that there are very different relate, social relations around labor and, um, I mean, obviously, in the slave ship, black people became objects. So they became what, I guess what I was trying to say, they, they're becoming what coal miners are sort of extracting, in a sense, from the coal. Um, pit. But um, it's interesting though, the black, the, those semiotics of blackness, because I don't think coal miners, I don't think there are black coal miners, at least a sort of a robust, you know, body until the 20th century. So I think probably it's connected to the Windrush, um, with the, with the um, increase of ca immigration from the Caribbean into the UK. Um, and there are there, there are some, um, the, the mining strikes in the 70s, I think that was where there were a lot of black miners involved in the strikes, but then in the 80s, um, I think a, a lot of black miners were kind of excluded from that sort of um, r rhetoric of the, you know, around the coal mine and the figure of the coal mine as this kind of hero of working class labor. Um, but in the 19th century, there are black coal miners in the US, which is, not really connected to this, but, but they're, um, they, I think particularly in the South, um, and I'm not sure, I think, I think obviously more after emancipation, but at the time that I'm talking about there, so I haven't come across any, yeah, any black or white. Thanks a so lot. A couple of questions in the middle of the room, yeah. Um, thank you, Anne, for your talk. Um, the photographs of the mining strikes, were they under Thatcher? Yeah, that was the, that's sorry, I should put that there. It was from 80... Could you get your mic on? Sorry. Yeah, 84 and 85, those were the... The Thatcher mining strikes. Yeah. yeah. It, it's just interesting and also sort of speaking to Ian's point, you know, about art being moved around, relocated into new conversations. I mean, we all know how we feel about Thatcher, but one thing she did do is she shut down the coal mine and now the air is clean because those mines were shut down. So, you know, looking at those photographs, it's sort of interesting. <laughs> yes, though, though you will note it on the banner, it's not just miners' jobs that this is about. Yeah. Never was there a truer word sprayed across the banner uh, of a 1980s protest. 
because you know it wasn't. It turned out that it wasn't just about the miners' jobs. It was indeed about the the ushering in of the neoliberal um, uh, settlement. And you know the. I mean, I was. I wasn't there because I was a good middle class boy who didn't go up north in those days, you know. But I was politically active in the mid 80s, and it was very obvious that this was the tip of an iceberg, the iceberg which has been pretty much unconcealed now, uh, though there's still probably some left to come. I mean, in other words, those were very striking photos of, of something larger than just, you know, mine solidarity. But nevertheless, yeah, they did close. <laughs> And that was an environmental, I mean, you know, I'm on the same page, yeah. but it was an environmental triumph. I mean, there are no longer those sort of pea soup fox because those mines, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm not at all advocating for that neoliberalism, but it's just interesting, the sort of conversations that images can uh, conjure. Do you want to say no, I was just going to say that what has interested me in doing some research on Poland is that these questions around, you know, the miners and then what's happening kind of in London and around, you know, in areas like Brixton and um, there isn't a, actually a lot of, from what I've come across so far, hasn't, there hasn't been a lot of overlap in, in the history. So it would be interesting to, to, to look more at that, you know, at those connections between these different tensions around race and class in different places within the UK. Another question here. Um, I just thought it might be interesting to point out that there was an alliance between Paul Robeson and the Welsh coal miners in the 20s because he, there was the singing connection as well. But he came there and through their, uh, he witnessed their, their uh, class struggles and, and workers' rights struggles, and he saw an alliance there, and the fact that they they were black wasn't yeah. overlooked, but they very much admired him, and he became quite involved in their um, struggles for better conditions and rights at that time. Oh, thank you. I didn't realise that. That's great. Yeah. There's a show at the um, otherwise difficult to take uh, Musée du Quai Branly at the moment. Um, uh, <laughs> on Paul Robeson, and it's a kind of an interesting and fascinating look. Um, I'm just, I've been thinking about permanence in, in your suggestion of the temporal um, and the ways in which it's really interesting in all these papers, we have these images of complete transformation, like the one we're looking at up here, but we also have this undercurrent of, of, um, of the ephemeral, right? So the blackness of the coal miner is washed off, right? It's a t that 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 semiotic blackness goes away and can go away for the white coal miner. It's really, you know, so so that is a is a kind of performance that is happening, you know, daily. The washing, and someone pointed out yesterday, the the washing of the clothes and the washing of all these, you know, the the, the, the part of of that labor that that is cleaned off essentially, right? Um, and also with this, uh, with Matthew's images, which are ephemeral in, in a sense, that they're fleeting, they're going away, they're lost. Um, and uh, it's really the performance art as well, that we, we rely on these images um, of something that is really, um, it's mined, it's, it's brought to the surface, but then just seems to disappear. So there's this really interesting tension, and I don't know if there's a question here, as much as a kind of observation, that that uh, as much as we think of this massive transformation, this permanent state, this state of crisis uh, of global warming, that we are also dealing with these very subtle changes that we very readily can lose sight of, right? And so this whole idea of excavation is to bring it up and then, in a sense, watch it just disappear. It's really um, kind of haunting, actually, that, that there's so much that we've forgotten about the hard histories that we can recover again, but there's so much we can't find again that we can't get back to that is gone or is that is only lived tempor temporarily. So I wondered if any of you maybe had thoughts about this, this, this bigger, larger question of permanence and impermanence. Um, I'll just say one thing really quickly, which is that in, in black studies anyway, there are some writers like Fred Moten and oh, Sadie yeah. Hartman who 
are thinking about these questions. I mean, and Christine, Christine is sharp, actually. Um, and often, so terms like the hold or fugitive, um, they, they're sort of these uh, geographies, I guess, of the, of the ephemeral. So you sort of, and, and they, they, kind of, they come out of a, they come out of a framework of, you know, of thinking about um, the ephemerality of blackness within different aspects of history. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a useful position to sort of start from in terms of looking at history and, and image making. But so, yeah, I mean, those are the three that I've, I've been thinking okay. of in relation to that. I'm very struck by this, um, this contrast that Ian ended with, which, it, it, you know, in its sort of summing up of a certain kind of not only social and economic inequality in the sense that one can buy enormous tracts of land for prospecting still, uh, against a traditional, uh, in, in a land in which there has been no proper settlement, no legal settlement of the land ownership rights of almost any area on, on a national basis in Australia. There is no treaty. And this is the continuation of the vastness of a certain kind of vision of empire which says, oh, here's a nice empty space. Let's dig for whatever's under here. The whole idea that there is a and you know, a, 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 an ur emptiness. Whereas in fact, the communities you were talking about prize every small detail of the non-emptiness of a land in order to try and make sense of it, whether it's grubs or trees or whatever it is. But the massive inequalities at that heart are, you know, I mean, it, I hate to be kind of, you know, old fashioned Marxist about it, but there, there, there nevertheless remains something kind of scarringly graphically available to us in these images, which which points to a fundamental inequality, doesn't it? I mean, or it's fundamental inequality that we still have to kind of deal with as a as a hump to get over with, even if we are more more subtle in our analysis or wish to be more subtle in our analysis. I don't know whether you want to comment on any of that or whether we should just take that as a, rem a reminder and a given, um, or whether there's more we should or could be doing to think it through. What I mean, that's the reason I, I ended that way. I, I wanted to, you know, after getting into sort of what was really a sort of philosophical discourse to try and bring it back at, at the end to, to, to a political discourse, um, I, I, of course, don't have any answers to that. And I don't know if anyone does have answers to that. And in, invariably, in these these situations, you find indigenous communities themselves are divided mm -hmm. as to whether they want the mining, or they want the mine, or they don't want the mine. And um, so, uh, so it is a very difficult issue. And you have you know you have very um, what uh, influential and powerful indigenous leaders like Marcia Langton, who's very supportive of. Um, you know, she believes mining will bring employment and, um, and modernity, if you like, to these communities, and that's the only way and it's going to happen. Then you have, a, of course, a whole other uh, indigenous camp which is against that, and the, the divisions in the indigenous community really mirror the divisions within the non-indigenous community about these things. But the legal, yeah, the legal thing, you know, that's something, of course, that things like Marbo, wrestle with and that have not really been able to I mean, people think that Marbo got rid of Terranalias but it but it didn't and it, it can't get the Australian, the Australian legal system can't get rid of Terranalias because it is the law on which by which we have settled this country so the court if the court does that it makes itself illegal and therefore unable to rule on it so it has to come up with all sorts of other other ways to try and um, give um, some sort of sovereignty, and sovereignty is not actually ownership of the land. It's it's certain legal rights to the land. So the miners only have a lease to mine it underground, to, to mine 
to mine the underground. They don't actually own the land, it remains crown land. It could even be, I don't know, the indigenous people might even have land rights there. But land rights doesn't give them ownership, doesn't mean they can actually sell it. It just gives them legal use, certain legal uses of that of that land, which are actually quite different to... I mean, we think that about our suburban block, that we own it, but we don't. A mining company could take out a lease on it and start digging underground. We, we have a different legal lease which allows us to buy and sell it to someone else. <laughs> so, so, you know, uh, the whole legal question is a very difficult thing that I, I'm, I certainly don't have the skills to solve, but in, in a way they can only probably be solved by, by um, both sides either fighting it out and one side exterminating the other, which is, we tried that, or, or negotiating in some way. And I guess that's what's, that's what's going on here, these, the, the, you know, these people have, have, have got, as you can tell by the, the banners they're holding, they've got a whole environmental movement behind them, they've got a whole legal team working with them, and the mining company puts out um, these beautiful sublime photographs on their website, and uh, they will have Indigenous people working on the mine, and if you go to their website, you'll find, you'll learn about all the wonderful things they're doing environmentally for this landscape and, and, and for the people. And, um, it's, you know, I, I don't think there's any, any um, easy answer to these questions, but I don't think that means we should not talk about them. Yeah. Another question. These are three such complex and beautiful papers. Yes, um, I think the process you all emphasise process rather than end products or results. And even, even though I have my problems with Heidegger in Aboriginal Australia, I tried it too, especially with being capital B. You know. Um, when there is no, in no indigenous language I know, a word for being, so it's all about, it's more his Dasein, you know, this being for, that's um, the active engagement of presency that evokes quite a different temporality, not this block transcendental thing that can be accessed in any, in any way. So it's a very complex questions, but I think this thinking about process um, we need to start thinking about restoration and repair. So how, what, you know, how can this be made good again, this big scar ever? I mean, probably not. But um, can art help um, in re-making value in this sense by uh, restoring landscapes? That was one of the questions I wanted to put. Um, another brief sort of association I had was about what kinds of creativity have you portrayed in all your three different papers, you know, so I was very interested in this, um, Matthew, your um, describe this envy about and sort of secrecy of holding, you know, knowledge um, about chemical processes. Um, no, it's not chemical, it's not chemical, you know, which seems to be a more powerful agent of transformation kind of thing. But there seems to be a kind of creativity that was being um, claimed, you know, in making new things. And of course, the biochemical revolution has been massively transforming the world's materiality. Um, so it's not just a question of power as such, but what forms of creativity are you describing? Um, the same with um, I thought Pollard's work. You know, it's so amazing what you said about walking as a creative experience of refining things which completely resonates for me with indigenous forms of walking the land, which is associated with singing. Um, because it's, it's knowing and making in real time in the now. It's not just finding a deep path. So this layering, you know, you, you know of um, Aboriginal projects on um, archaeological sites with artists like Mandy Martin and others, you know, um, where people look at the story of the dingo, my story is in that mine, she's saying here, the, um, Karen Manson is saying here. Um, but in Western Australia, they have, around Lake Gregory, um, people look at 
bingo tracks and uh, stories, ancestral stories, that archaeologists wanted, of course, timeline to prove the ancestry of these stories. Yes, Aboriginal people have been here for 60,000 years, now maybe 70,000 years. Actually, it's a total present time at the same time, which is so important to understand. You know, people are reincarnations of these things, these ancestors coming into the now all the time. It's more spatial temporality, if that makes sense. Even though they're caught in proving their ancestry in our temple so time frames all the time. Um, I don't know if that's making sense, but what I'm trying to say is depth doesn't necessarily mean a long time ago. You know, geographical layering depth in, in the, not the beginning of the people I know of. This, oh, yes, it's always been there, this recycling, as you call it, you know. It's more like the past perfect in a, in a grammatical form, you know. It's going on being all the time, yeah. But it doesn't mean it's not the fossil, basically. That's yeah, I mean, that's how I understand the, the, the temporality, if you like, of indigenous thinking. That, um, that, you know, ancestors could actually have not lived very long ago. But, but at the same time, there is a, a, what, a resonance or reverberation of deep time in the present, always. And um, I guess um, a, a tr traditional indigenous art is very much about maintaining this, this cycle of returning everything back and around as opposed to, you know, because if you, oh, that hasn't got the painting of the, of the dollars, or the dollars in the, in the truck, but, you know, that, that painting that, that, in, that was done, sorry, um, I'm sure you can remember it, of the trucks carrying away the money, well, the, you know, the truck is the Heideggerian clearing and the money is the truth, but that mine is taking away and when, where's it going? It's not, it's not going back into the earth, in, into that earth where it, where it came from. And, and that's perhaps what you were getting at, you know, in your, in your question and what uh, you know, you're getting at. In, in your question, it's going to, it's this, it's this reserve which is going, going elsewhere. Yeah, you know that. Yeah, it's that one there. I'm yeah. sure trying to get it better for you. But. Yeah, but that mine, I mean, this mine is not is a potential incredible environmental disaster. Because what they've done is they've diverted the river, which is what that painting is about, they've diverted the river and in order to mine under the river, like under the Sydney Harbour. <laughs> and um, if all the stuff that they're mining out of that gets into that river, it's going into the Gulf of Carpentaria, it's going to destroy, we won't be able to eat prawns anymore at Christmas. <laughs> it's this sort of incredible environmental disaster waiting to happen and, and when it does happen, of course the indigenous people will say we, we told you so. The, an the ancestors have got their, you know, if, if we don't do it right, well that's what's going to happen. So, and, um, and I suppose that's the leverage that the indigenous people are now using to try and stop that mine. But it's, it's just a leverage I think they're using to get to get ownership of it again, to control it, yeah. If I could just respond briefly um, to your question, and uh, maybe in a way to Amy's uh, provocation earlier, one of the things that, a sort of motif that I follow through this book is the way in which these artists, experimentalists, uh, so on and so forth, take up chemical materials, materials that they describe as chemical, and which are frequently extremely dangerous, artificial phosphorus, uh, other gun cotton, and uh, they are often combustible, and they use them almost compulsively to, they change in time, and they use them to conceptualize time. This is what they repeatedly do. And many of these, again, are things that geologists Synthetic materials that geologists now identify as techno-fossils of the Anthropocene. So this raises an interesting sort of methodological issue about where we position the temporality into which these artifacts are participating, where they are seen from our distanced vantage point now 
in this, if you subscribe to Anthropocene talk and procedures and evidentiary mechanisms and stratigraphic layering of a global signal for the onset of uh, humanity as global force equivalent to nature, so on and so forth, these are the things that show up as being significant. But they are also utilized, understood by the agents that I'm tracking, who are very frequently self-consciously aware of the previous iteration in the relay that I follow sort of from the 1670s, the creation of artificial phosphorus. Then the 1770s, when people like Joseph Wright of Darby depicts the construction of artificial phosphorus, makes it into a subject of oil painting and its display in you know, the exhibitions emerging in 1760s London as Joshua Reynolds, who comes from the same painter studio as does Wright of Darby, is embracing discursively and practically into his pictures these highly unstable chemical materials which are then preserved in the 1790s after Reynolds's death by chemomechanical means or by chemical means explicitly, which will preserve those fugitive chemical forms to eternity by new chemical means, which are then discovered again in the 1860s and taken as evidence, called photographs, and taken as evidence that photography had been invented in the 1780s or 90s, something like that. And that kind of curious temporality or recursive movements, all of which are linked to these synthetic materials or embedded with these synthetic materials, which are now causing a planetary rupture in time, it seems to me to be extremely interesting and challenging, but also where it doesn't give us, I mean, I showed you, I tortured you with these images from patent drawings and all sorts of strange things that don't answer easily to our art historical training, at least if you're informed by the sort of formalist tradition of regal and so on and so forth, which is expressly hostile to technical explanations of art. And uh, so uh, part, of the part of the proposition of the book is that we need a different set of tools to engage with uh, the elemental, the, that which is very real but not always visible and uh, that moves between and beyond the, and behind and within the ambit of the arts and uh, technologies. We may have to come back because I think the very innocent question, what's the time of the artwork, provokes a big discussion of temporality, which I hope we might return to in the round table. For the moment, we are, I have gone slightly over the uh, tea break moment, and so, but tea break we shall have right now. I want to thank our panelists and our, and so <laughs>